being told the right way to do something and we're wrong. But when you have the experience, it's magic. And part of the magic is nonviolent communication works even unilaterally, even if only one person in an act interaction is doing it, even invisibly it works. And it can work even under the most brutal and horrific of conditions. In my take, it works so well because it's based on universal principles. Um, and if this was a longer presentation, I'd correlate with Jung and Wilbur and all the world's wisdom traditions. But the unstated underpinning is that we consist of four, you can count four levels, body, emotions, intellect, and spirit. You know, pure consciousness, Atman, <clears throat> Buddha nature, soul, higher self, whatever you want to call it. Nonviolent communication works because it acknowledges these four levels and moves through them in a very precise system. It, uh, Marshall Rosenberg, who created this, never stated this explicitly as far as I know, but it starts with the underlying assumption that he does state explicitly that who we really are in our deepest essence is the pure consciousness, the soul, the Buddha, the Atman, and so on. And at our deepest essence, the most rewarding, most meaningful thing we can do is contribute to the well-being of ourselves or some other being. And this is true for everybody, no matter how brutalized. Ways of thinking can block our access to this level of ourself. And so nonviolent communication is a way of training ourselves to think and speak in ways that remove the blocks to coming from this deep essence in a very pure and direct way. Anything that blocks this access to our deepest nature really is unfulfilling for ourselves and for everybody else. And people are, it just is so wonderful for everybody when it really works. So nonviolent communication as a system is a way to learn to drop all the unfortunate ways of communicating that block our innate compassion, our innate presence, our essence, such as analyzing, intellectualizing, diagnosing, blaming or consoling, advising, trying to fix it, questioning, shaming, minimizing, and so on. And this is one of the parts that takes a lot of practice to really do it spontaneously. Now, aside from these four steps that are up on the screen that Natalie and I will be, Natalie will be talking me through in a moment, there are other essential aspects of NVC that augment and support these four steps. I want to mention three. They may come up for discussion. If they do, we'll discuss them. One is empathic, empathetic listening, to be really present. One is dropping all attachment to any given outcome. And the third is to take responsibility for our thoughts and emotions, the story we're telling ourselves. And you will note in passing that these all three are qualities of deep psychological maturity and indeed high states of spiritual attainment. And you can get there with NVC without any of the blah, blah. It just can take us straight there. So by training in nonviolent communication, we can also accelerate growing in these ways personally. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Natalie. Just one more comment. I love NVC above all because it works. So let's see if we can see what we can do with it. Mm. Natalie. <clears throat> um, thank you. Yeah. Um, what really stands out from what you were sharing, Karen, is how NVC does work unilaterally. Um, my mm -hmm. experience has been that others learn um, emotional intelligence for themselves just by my use of NVC because it um, really gets to what's underneath. Sorry, can you repeat, can you repeat the sentence? I, I miss it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the NVC works unilaterally because mm -hmm. it gets to what's underneath our communication more than just the words that we're, we're saying. It, it hears the implicit. Um, which is really connected to what a lot of Wilbur's um, value structures and stages are about, um, those underlying values. And um, so many of us uh, live in a, a reactive state often or just at times, and NBC is a tool to um, kind of dismantle that reactivity and get down to the vulnerable part that just makes you feel like, Oh, yeah, that's actually what's going on without all of the tornado that we often um, add to the, the experience of the story. So, um, 
Yeah, there's um, some other nuances that we can touch on, but um, I think that those will come up maybe between a practice conversation between Karen and I. And so what I'll do is um, we'll, we'll have our conversation, Karen will share something, um, a story, an experience, uh -huh. and um, I'll um, offer some em empathy using the NBC format and also um, share myself a little bit too. Okay. And I'll do a few timeouts to name some of the key points. Okay. And I, I'm going to be the one who's going to Natalie to cry on her shoulder. Um, and I will deliberately do it wrong. And then Natalie can say, this is, this is what we're trying to get away from. And, and then what we're trying to get toward. So Natalie, I just, I'm so upset. This gal, I think I've been trapped into another codependent relationship with, with a borderline person. I mean, I felt so attacked. I just, you know, I just, you know, this is not the first time this has happened to me. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just not sure how to deal with this because now I'm not just afraid of her, I'm kind of afraid of myself. So I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a mess about this. <clears throat> Mm, um, yeah, Karen, so actually what I'll do is I'll pause real quick and say that uh, a good way to start is just a reflection, kind of a summary repeat of what it is that you hear the person saying so they feel heard and not immediately manipulated. Okay. So coming back to, to the conversation, um, I'd say something like, Karen, I hear that you're feeling really concerned about the relationship that um, you're starting now and starting to notice a pattern that has you, um, do you feel a little bit like contracted and reluctant to even engage there? I, I feel torn because I want to reach out to this suffering person and there's a lot of real interesting stuff there, but then I just got blindsided by this, these accusations and, and she just missed, I, I felt so much, she just misunderstood everything I said. And it's just like, I got slammed by this thing, but I don't want to just cut her off either because mm -hmm. I see where she's suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a lot of um, juice that you may find that you feel in the relationship, a lot of potential, um, but that potential uh, doesn't feel very, very good for how you want to live your life like the, the way that it's being communicated? Yeah, like I, f I feel like I need to protect myself now. Gotcha, yeah. Okay, so let's pause again. Um, nice. And uh, so on that, that sheet, uh, we have observations as the first step. And the opposite of observations is evaluations. And um, so what I hear Karen saying at first is she feels attacked, um, she um, notices some, some patterns happening in the conversation with her partner. And um, those two things, those two feelings are, are very different. Um, the observations are more about sense experiences or things that you can um, notice without adding extra story to it. Um, yeah. And it can, I have a time out. I deliberately did that because step one is observation where we eventually take this because we don't want to take up the whole hour time with this. You eventually want to take it to step one, the observation, which is my, my shortcut for this is something you could record on a video camera, not a feeling like I felt attacked to saying somebody attacked me or not um, an abstract like you're always so controlling but something that a specific that could be recorded on a video camera so Natalie's going to eventually talk me through to that stage a specific that that is an observation not a feeling or a or an analysis mm -hmm. um, so the the next level is feelings and I'd say feelings versus like a victim verb um, for example um, attacked would be a victim verb there's um, an emotion there, but it's it's really a faux feeling because it's turning the emotion into something that's happening to you rather than an internal experience that is there. Um, so other examples of faux feelings would be, um, mm, let me see if I can think of some. Um, attacked is a great one. Um, misunderstood. Misunderstood is a great one. Because, excuse me, in both cases, we're underlying that it sounds like a, a feeling, but it's really saying somebody else did something to me. Mm -hmm. And that's a really easy trap to fall into. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And here, uh, here I find my cheat is I keep a handy list of feelings. And when I get really stumped in a place like this where I'm fumbling, I just go to my list of feelings. How do I feel when I'm, I'm feeling happy, when I'm feeling sad? And you can be peaceful, calm, friendly, satisfied, delighted. So it really helps to have that sheet to refer to. Um, and the other thing uh, that could happen between Kieran and I is I could give her um, a version of like false empathy. So uh, basically what empathy is, is uh, curiosity. Huh. And um, we tend to respond to, with things like, oh, I've experienced that too. And we share our story to feel some sense of shared reality and connection. Um, but that when someone is sharing a vulnerable experience and you jump in with your story, it's kind of like stealing your thunder and they may not be ready for that. Um, and that's also not to say that um, sharing your experience can be empathy and be very helpful, but um, asking if the person is interested <clears throat> in hearing your experience and making sure that they have felt heard before you share your experience um, can help to uh, calm down the, the tornado that happens around a lot of these um, challenges. Um, okay, so let's, let's continue. So let's boil down the first step here so we can move on to the second is that uh, basically if Nettle and I were doing this for real, she would eventually get me to the place where I state that I had an, an exchange via text message where this person went on this long screen and, the, and, and you can take a video of that text message session. Um, where she accused me of many things that and, and misunderstood things. I'd, anyway, there is a text message here that triggered this, and we would boil that down to step one. And then Natalie would draw out how I feel about it as opposed to my judgments interpretation. So shall we move to that step and mm -hmm. let's see how Natalie does that? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we actually started to do it a little bit. We got uh -huh. down to, um, I forget what it is that you said already, Karen, but it was one of the last things. Do you remember? I don't know. I, well, I remember saying I felt attacked and I felt like she mis, was misjudging what I was saying. Did I actually get to an actual feeling? We did that? get to a feeling. Yeah. Okay. Um, something yeah. about like, um, you felt afraid? Scared. Yeah. Scared. There, that's what it was. Scared. So, so some of that reflection process can often draw out the, the underlying feeling experience. And so... So that you, you felt scared around her, scared to um, was, be... And, I, and it hurt. I was in pain. Yeah. So what is it that you are really wanting from this connection? What is it that you're really valuing, valuing especially in that moment, that time that you're thinking of right now? Um, I'll, we'll keep this short, so I'll, I'll cut through a lot of phony... Because we could, we could, you can spend a lot of time in this too, but eventually Natalie would draw out of me that I felt a real connection with this woman's, um, she's so interesting, and I was, en I was enjoying the participation, the communication, the um, community, and I also wanted to help her because she is in some very difficult situations. She's having trouble just affording to eat. She has a deteriorating disease. It's affecting her brain. So it's affecting her behavior. So I want to, don't want to, I don't want to be one, another one person, one of the people who's abandoned her. So I would get to my need to contribute, my desire to, my genuine desire to contribute, my compassion, my desire to keep the connection with her while staying safe myself, and is this possible? So I'm not sure how to boil that all down, but we we would we would work through it until Natalie drew, draw, draws this out for me. Um, so Karen, another thing that I noticed was that you said that you felt torn, and yes. what I'm hearing in in the feelings and needs that you're that you're aware of right now is the need to contribute and um, to to support her, mm -hmm. and also there's this feeling of being torn and I'm wondering if the relationship is actually not very satisfying for you if there's something different that you're really wanting from the relationship and those two experiences are kind of squished into one does that feel accurate uh, it's close and and notice here that 
a skilled NVC person like Natalie is more skilled than I am can pause it. Are you feeling torn because you're wanting something from this at the same time you're afraid of it? It's okay to guess wrong. And Natalie, you and I were talking about this because then that's the person, my person feels heard and she can say, it doesn't matter if you guess wrong because then I'll say, oh, close, but that's not quite it. I mean, it's more like I need to protect myself. I, I felt, I, I mean, this is this. Peop, I've been in things, situations like this, and they end up draining all my time and energy. And I and I need to cut this off to protect myself. But I don't want to be yet another one person who's abandoned her. So I mean, and this goes back and forth, and it can go on for a long time. Eventually, you get to a point where I say, I am torn between my desire to be there for this fascinating, brilliant person who I do enjoy talking to versus my need to protect myself from yet another codependent relationship that drains me. And the point at which Natalie gets there and draws it out of me, you can tell the energy changes kind of, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You can tell when that moment is reached. Ah. Uh. And this actually helped me uh, form. I had not formulated to myself nearly as clearly until we went through this exercise together in front of you all, by the way. Thank you. Um, so the, the fourth level is the requests. And so, um, Karen, hearing that you're feeling a little bit torn about um, the two different kinds of needs that you have in relationship, I'm wondering if there's um, a way that you can stay connected to yourself and protect yourself and engage to the, the degree that feels like authentic and natural and in alignment with your values and needs. This, this will be a, an interesting balancing act. And I'll, we'll cut to the chase here because we, we do want to cut this off and for everybody to speak. But what I have already worked out is, I mean, you know, first of all, I listened to, I educated myself more on, on, I'm sorry, borderline personality disorders and codependent and so on. And I see a path forward where I will not reach out to her because that's kind of her trigger to dump on me, dump her affect. But I will wait. If she reaches out to me, I will respond. I will stay emotionally um, filtered. I will correspond on content and things we mutually share about. But when she goes into the dumping, the, the storm of negative affect, I will be just non-react, basically non-reactive, and use this as an opportunity to see what comes up in me. We've had this conversation, Ryan, on our Talking with Teal. It's a chance to work on myself, look what's coming up in me, and work on that separately. So that's the resolution I came to. Great. Um, and NBC also does recommend um, empathetic interruption in huh. the sense of when someone is really dumping um if we're not able to be in empathetic connection it's not a good connection for either person um we tend to notice that subconsciously and then that can, can we can feel abandoned even in connection and so the the recommendation is to say like you know um can can you pause for a minute i really like want to be here with you and i really want to hear what you're saying but i'm starting to lose track of the important thing that you're trying to communicate. And so I'm wondering if um, there's a way that you could share that in maybe a sentence so I can really get your experience and be there with you. Um, so that's, those are examples of um, requests that Karen and I have just gone through. And the difference between a request and a demand um, is um, a request is, uh, comes from like a very physical feeling of being able to receive no for an answer and being able to meet your needs in a different way. Um, and that could be meeting them yourself, it could be walking away, it could be finding someone else or a different way to meet those needs. But it's not just that one person has to meet it in one way at one time, um, versus a demand is that that one, one, one experience. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> And I'll point out that you can do this for yourself all by yourself. Yes. It works Very just nice. as much inwardly for ourselves. And that can be so liberating. I've used it for myself many times. Um, and that's a really good point that um, 
NVC is really, in my experience, a tool for self-empathy first. Um, so that we step out of our reactivity. Um, and the challenges with NVC, um, that, that coercion element, um, they happen usually in the first two years of practice when yeah. we're getting used to understanding, giving ourselves empathy and recognizing who we really are, developing our emotional intelligence. Um, sorry, sorry. Can you expand a little bit what you mean this issue of coercion? Yeah. Um, um, so there's been times when I've felt NVC'd by other people where they're using the format to try to get my experience in a way that is pushy. And that often comes from um, a foundation of not under, like uh, the, the, the person that's doing the pushiness, not really understanding um, themselves yet. They're not, they haven't developed the NVC consciousness, which those are four simple steps here. It takes about two years to um, change our way of um, hearing conversation happen, our ways of hearing our own thoughts and our own experience happen. So that, that self-empathy um, building is, is really the foundation. And um, it's great to uh, practice uh, about once a week is what I found, once a week practice for two years. Um, and then there's something that flips and it becomes a natural conversational flow when people don't notice that you're using the structure. Um, and when people notice that you're using the structure, they often get irritated because it does sound jargony and like, like, oh yeah, another groupie of some cult thing. I've gotten that reaction a lot. And once you get really adept at it with the two years, like Natalie says, you can use it without being obvious and obtrusive. It flows naturally and folksy. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that's about it for yeah. the, the essentials. There's all sorts of nuance that can, can come online through those years, but um, pick up a book, start practicing in some way, and really start practicing with yourself. Journaling is a great way talking to yourself when you get home from work and you're feeling reactive or something like that. Thank you to both of you. Um, many years ago, I went, my husband came up to me one day and said, I think we need to go into therapy. And I was like, who are you having an affair with? And he laughed and said, no one, but I, I think it'd just be a good idea to have a safety net in case something happened. And um, I mean, we had a great marriage and nothing like that ever happened, but we went to, he, we were literally at a car wash and on a bulletin board next to where we were sitting were a bunch of business cards thumb tacked up to this bulletin board. He walked over, he pulls this guy's business card off the, the board and it says uh, counsel, marriage counseling for couples. So we call the guy, we go see the guy, we go in, we sit down and he leans back in his chair and he looks at us and he goes, so how can I help you? And we looked at each other and we said, our marriage is great. We're just here to have a, you know, establish a relationship with a therapist if we need it. And he said, fantastic. He said, let's do three sessions on how to communicate. And he taught us fair fighting, which is, um, uh, sounds like it might have been a precursor to all of this. And it's a way that when you get, you know, really angry with somebody and it's a red light situation and you're just yelling at each other, one of us would eventually say, so it sounds like what you're saying is, and then just it created, you know, the, the, the heat of the moment just went away, it evaporated, and it created so much more space. So I've heard of this concept of NBC, but I've not looked into it, but I'm excited to hear about it because it, I can't tell you how many times it talked us off the ledge. We were able to just come back to each other. So it sounds like what you're saying is blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, no, that's not quite what I was saying, what I was saying. Okay, so blah, 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 and then you switch positions and you're actually heard and you yeah. get to a point where you're not uh, talking over each other and trying to uh, judge and prove your the goal is to listen so I, I will definitely look into this more and as you guys know I'm also an acupuncturist and I use huh. a lot of this in my practice but I have I didn't realize there was such a structure that I can now uh, yeah. study and and use even more so thank you for sharing sure it sounds like what you're describing is what we in we call empath emp, empathetic listening, 
which yeah. is one of the main, absolutely key main pillars of NVC, and it can be practiced on its own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah fair fighting is what he called it. He was yeah. just like, he said, let's do three sessions, and we did, and we never went back, and, and it was life changing. Thanks. Um, there is one more component that's coming up that um, I'm actually giving myself empathy about in the process uh, right now, which is um, pausing. The value of pausing before you run into giving empathy it, to really become self-connected um, is huge. And the, the speed of our conversation, Karen, was one where uh, we had a time constraint and so there wasn't um, the space to pause and so like I'm here giving myself empathy about like wow that was really fast did I do a good job huh. oh, you know there's there's a, a tension in my system because I wasn't able to uh, I'm a slow but deep thinker and um, so my, my self empathy was able to get to well um, I'm, I'm just I don't feel comfortable in fast environments and that's okay mm -hmm. I'm willing to take the risk um, often because huh. I know who I am, I know it's a stretch, and I don't need to take it personally that I'm not able to think that fast. Um, so I was able to de-escalate the, the tension in my system. Hopefully that's a good example. Yeah. I, have a, I have a question. I'm not really sure how to formulate it, but it's like I can feel myself having this, um, like I can see the beauty of MVC and then having this big um, green aversion. Like, um, I don't know if people know about authentic no, I think they've changed the name. It used to be Authentic World. So I've, I often do like loads of um, circling practice. And um, it seems like they kind of use a lot of NVC as a bedrock. And yet it can still, it's like there's a certain um, style of conversation that, that can't show up. Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess to me, there's a hunch around like um, having conflict or being like we talked about red last week or like anger, there's a certain part of, I can feel my redness kind of like getting um, activated. Maybe, I, I don't know if you, if you two might be able to like um, help me out there as and to like maybe some of it, why it's being, why it is an integral practice or like is some of that uh, just like, if it's in the hands of people that are green, that it's gonna go that way or yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and I feel like that's where the value of um, compassionate interruption can come into play because there, there can be a tendency for a sense of endless processing to, to happen in some of those authentic circles. And, um, you know, it, and it happens where it, you have to be authentic in this way. You can't include the mental um, component of our experience or, or something like that. And so mm -hmm. to, um, to pause and to say this is what's real for me to to um, stand in in that truth and to be able to not have um, a demand mm -hmm. and also not necessarily receive a demand if it doesn't feel real but instead experience those environments as more of a request where you can use that red protective energy to to walk away or to to stand in um, uh, your truth to, to share your truth can I share an observation to, to perhaps tie with what Paul said? Uh, Paul, when you say you have this sort of green aversion, red, red powered green aversion, I, I, I can understand where that may come. And intuitively, I feel that to me seems very related to the point that you were making um, about when it feels pushy, when it feels not authentic. Uh, so my question for Paul would be, would you agree that it is possible that this aversion comes when you feel that what's coming at you is kind of more like a, a ploy rather than an authentic desire to understand what you are. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely part of that, but I think some of it, like my experience in Greenland is there's this constant focus to the, the inner child. So it starts to feel like very under boundary and feelings based and uh, Natalie, it's funny because you said something like empathy is curiosity, or I think that was something you said, and I agree that that's a big part of it. But that's something I've thought about in in, in authentic world because there's a lot of um, emphasis on curiosity, and there are times where I find it's like almost pathological. Maybe it does come across this thing of like um, 
boundaries. Like some of these boundaries are being intruded and someone's being like overly naively curious, like a kind of child is like, oh, I'm curious, you seem very angry. And they're sort of talking to someone who's like, yeah, I'm about to slit your throat kind of, it, it doesn't get that extreme, but I'm, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Um, and also I've noticed around pain that like, if, if really deep pain is brought up, it's sort of like there can be this curiosity that seems almost, um, I don't know, like dumb at times. Yeah. Like it's sort of like, yeah. again, to over exaggerate, there's a way that the pain doesn't show up to inner child land. It's like, yeah, I got my leg cut off. And then someone's like, oh yeah, so I can imagine that's quite painful. Or something. I, like there's a, I don't know if I'm doing a great job of explaining it, but it's sort of, sometimes I found my judgment is more empathetic than someone's curiosity because it's like like something's just blaring blaringly obvious but they're still in curiosity land even though there's this big uh yeah i don't know if i'm explaining it that well but yeah um i'm i very much understand what you're saying and i have experienced it myself and to um jump to a bit more integral language what i find is that um um green is very related to the magenta magic stage and um, often a lot of that magenta shadow work starts to come up and the lack of boundaries starts to come up um, and the um, lack of like a solid sense of self starts to come up um, and so um, sometimes what what can be helpful is to to start to build structure um to you know the, the there's a difference between like i guess i'm still grappling also myself with the like healthy judgments versus unhealthy judgments and how um second tier starts to bring in a sense of direction a sense of effectiveness and um a sense of like real the again the real self kind of rambling a little bit here, so I'll pause. <laughs> I wanted yeah, to jump example. in here a moment because um, what you said, Paul, about this, let's say, inauthentic curiosity, I think that has something to do with identity. And um, in green, we can have the identity of the what Jordan Peterson calls the devouring mother. We, we need to, to, you know, to help everybody help everybody jump, or, or in Enneagram, Enneagram uh, type two, no? Who wants to, to be there for everybody. And instead of seeing the other people, uh, they want to do their own agenda by the help, no, by the, let's say it's like uh, the scapegoat, the other person for, for their own agenda, you know? So um, on the other hand, I think we need to say that a way of uh, communicating this way needs to be uh, to 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 have the green level of understanding because otherwise the 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 idea of empathy with somebody is is just not or the capacity is not really developed i think apart from your own family your own kids and even there you know sometimes not really but um, we need the the green level to be aware that we can be um, um, Pathetic with other people who we don't even know. But then, you know, I see it as a struggle to find the right way and partly to, 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 to do the shadow work. What type are you? What, what, what are these underlying motives? Why, why are you doing this? You know, so it's a lot to do. And thank you for, the, for, for leading us through. I think I have a real difficulty often, especially when people who are triggering me uh, when I talk with them to, to come into such a sort of conversation, which then feels to me sort of false, <laughs> trying to use that. Um, I, I would like if we could do maybe in some other moment, uh, some really some exercise sessions about different communication. I also have studied in another which, uh, conversation, which is called generative conversation which uh, communication, which is um, similar, but not the same. So, but you really need to, to practice it. So who is interested, I would be happy to do that. This real life examples of every one of us, you know, and maybe in three, two, one does the, let's say the therapist, the, and the other one brings the, uh, the problem and the third one, the observer to 
afterwards to see what what we did and not dead. You know, that would be great. Mm. Yeah, I want to thank you for your presentation too. Uh, I was um, interested in following it, and um, it um, what came up for me anyway um, was uh, to stay in response to being empathetic. Uh, the three, two, one formula that Wilbur talks about that I mindfully or consciously have to kind of consciously stay in first person. So I'm responding from myself um, to the other person. And uh, that's, that's helped me a lot rather than my talking at them or trying to get into advice giving or, or that type of thing. And I think that also helps me to move towards more of an empathic response. But I think um, what you guys shared enlarges that for me, you know, it kind of expands my mind um, how to, to how to make that or how to, to for room for growth, you know, and I thank you for awakening that awakening that in me uh, by your presentation. Yeah, I also want to thank you uh, for the presentation <laughs> and, and I found it very interesting. Um, and I, I didn't, I realized how much I didn't know about NVC, which I, I knew I didn't know a lot about it, but I found, I found the, the structure of it very interesting and in how you, you kind of moved through, uh, Karen, as you were mentioning at the, at the beginning, how it somehow it, it kind of reflects like the perennial philosophy of, of going to increasing levels of depth, starting with rather neutral observations, and then you can kind of proceed to deeper layers. You know, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it also made me realize how I'm really a terrible communicator. I mean, I, I really, the, the whole NBC way of uh, going about something for me is when I really get upset, it's very, very, it's the furthest thing from what's on my mind, you know, and, and my default is prosecuting attorney, as my girlfriend always says. You know, even right now when I just left to go to the bathroom and it was like, get the hell out of the bathroom. I, I have a need that needs to be fulfilled right now. <laughs> You know, and uh, for, yeah, for me, when there's, when there's a sense of urgency or something like what you were mentioning, mentioning Natalie about like being a time constraint or, or being like, you feel kind of constricted or it's in a professional setting where you have to get through it. I think it can be, it can be hard for me to like settle into that more of an NVC, like a gentler approach. And I just want to just really like bang, 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 boom, you know, um, and, and get it done without a lot of emphasis on how the other person feels. So, yeah, I have a, I'm going to do a lot of uh, studying and, and uh, yeah, excellent, ex excellent. And um, thank you so much. Just wanted to jump in and point out that NVC actually can be very forceful once you get good at it. And there's an example in that basic book by Marshall, which I will um, send to Heidi for her to post on my piece here. But I mean, he, Marshall gives an example. He came home after just a horrific day counseling gangs in St. Louis who were killing each other and they're trying to stop killing each other. And he was the one who was the mediator and he came home after a day thinking, I don't want to ever have to sit in a room with another fight again. And his two sons were, were squabbling. <laughs> and he walked in and he was practicing enough. He just, I mean, he actually yelled, I am in pain and I need some peace and quiet right now. And he, he yelled it. But, you know, he didn't say, kids, shut up, or don't you see? I mean, basically he said, I need. He was able to go right there because he was very good at it. So, I mean, there are times when you can be very forceful with it, but I don't think I'd put my red barbarian energy into drawing boundaries in quite that way until I really was adept and being sure that I wasn't just clobbering somebody. So, yes. Um, yes, there, there, and I, I have to say, I think the red barbarian likes, likes the structure. I think the red barbarian basically craves the structure. And that's that three-year-old that will always test you because it wants to know where the boundaries are. So having the boundaries is part of going up all these levels, right? And when we get to integral, this is what I was hearing during all the comments. It is so essential to be healthy, have every level functioning, doing what it does best in a more or less healthy way. And then at integral, we can put them all together and have access to them all the time fluidly as, they, as the need arises for the, you know, that red barbarian who sets boundaries and who, who recognizes 
when there's a need for a boundary or a boundary is being violated and comes roaring out Conan waving the sword, you know, to enforce that. I mean, we need every level and at integral I'm seeing, I'm seeing through this, con through all of this that all of you have thrown in here, how we need every level and we need at, se at, at second tier, we can have access to them fluidly as the need arises. And I'm going, wow, this is awesome. I think it's great what you say, Karen. I, what I see in, in forums or Facebook integral groups, this capacity is not really there to, to include uh, personal feelings and, and uh, to include um, this way of empathy. I, I see it like hick hack against you. You say that and I say, but, 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 but. And I recognize it a lot in myself too. So I think this is really... But we were talking about shadow in indigo. This is still something what we need to learn to communicate because we don't really know. I mean, still uh, already, not still already. When we talk in a setting like this, it's ten times different than when you talk with uh, green and orange people. You know, that's a different atmosphere. You feel it between us. We are sort of ready to to smile, ready to 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 receive the others without, and listen to the others without thinking, I have to now to, to come in, which in other groups, as I went away from other groups because of that. But still, I feel it in myself that I'm not really able to, to in important situations, to do this sort of communication. When I'm coaching people, yeah, I'm, I'm great. But as soon as something, you know, is touching me. <laughs> That's a good point, Heidi, that actually, um, so often we use NBC during challenges, but um, it's great to practice with people during good moments and to support connection <clears throat> in that way. It builds the structures in the same way. I would imagine that doing NVC is also much easier if you have um, done shadow work. And it would seem like if you've just come, if you, if you, if, if I am not doing, if I haven't done shadow work, going into something like this would be much more challenging. Does that make sense? Or is this, is NVC another method for dealing with shadow? Mm -hmm. Um, they definitely, they feel like they're very connected in that way. Um, I've experienced it more that NVC is a way that people get started on their shadow work path. Mm -hmm. They start to build the emotional intelligence and ability to self-reflect um, and see reality more. And then the shadow work starts to happen. But um, they do inform each other. It can work the other way around. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would add to that uh, totally what Natalie said. And in fact, NVC can be a really superb on-ramp onto doing your own shadow work because it takes us through those steps, first the physical, then the emotional, then the mental, and then the, you know, the consciousness, the spiritual. Um, and so if we're doing it and we can do it for ourselves all the time, we see what narrative we're adding to the pure emotion that's surging up spontaneously, what I'm, we, we learn to see what our own self-talk is. And this can be a very natural way in to say, wow, I didn't realize that was there. And then if people want to go specifically into shadow work, like in Ken Wilber's three, two, one process, and there are other ways to do it too, there's some superb resources. But that could be a very natural introduction to specifically doing the shadow work as a whole separate issue. And you say more about that because I, I don't really see that so much that this is uh, leading you to to um, mm -hmm. to observe your self talk and the, the leading into the shadow work. Yes. How is it? Is it because you listen to the other person skillful to ask you the questions and so you get the things out, or or the other, better other question? How do you work with yourself? Let let's ask that one. Okay, um, uh, Natalie, are you comfortable taking sure. that? Um, so the, the emphasis of NBC being used for ourselves is uh, something that I really want um, 
you all to, to take home. That's like the most valuable part of, of NBC for me. It's less about using it for other people. And so that's where the shadow work element comes in to, to recognize how am I feeling about this situation? What do I need to, to do in order to stay in connection with myself, in order to stay in connection with others? Um, and what was the second question that you had, Heidi? It, it was mainly how, how do you do it? Now I'm, for instance, this morning I was really upset because the old nobility here, they have private property where old Roman ruins are and they have decided to, to plow the whole thing so that we cannot go there anymore. So they use their, let's say, old fashioned power of, you know, rights to against the public interest and I was really really upset so how can I find out if that is uh, my shadow or is it <laughs> a real it's, uh, it's all Italians fault it's not yeah. your fault it's just the, those freaky Italians like, I know the world. Italians uh, <laughs> I will do something yeah. about it but anyway You're right I will Italian, send between an Italian and a German generally the German is right I can vouch for that <laughs> I will send, I we will do some petition and I will send to everybody of you to sign the petition because it's like yeah. <laughs> turning into medieval times, you know, it's, it's absurd. Anyway, how can I find out if this is uh, what I'm telling me myself is, uh, has some reason or if it is my own shadow, which my own sense of wanting to be authoritarian and uh, possess things and uh, overrun other people. There is a history of Germans having those kind of... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's a really, really good question. And um, what I'd say is patterns. We can have, you know, appropriate response in a moment, but if uh, we continue to have a similar response in many different situations, um, that, that can point to something that we haven't looked at yet. Can I add a comment to this? Because I think that, to, to your point, Heidi, one of, the, one of the biggest problems is that there is a ton of situations in which, like literally every situation in which the shadow is just doing its thing. And out of those situations, in a lot of them, that there is a degree of being right. Like there is a degree of logic to which you are making a valid case. And still, the, the shadow actually works against you and generally kind of, throws you even further into that situation because you're discussing from the standpoint of someone who is say a victim or like something like that. So I, I think that the, 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 to me, an important answer to that is that the, the two things are completely unrelated. Like the fact that there is a huge shadow does not mean you're wrong. And, and, and the separating those two, I think, makes it easier to reflect on one's own shadow because your own shadow work is not then the, the, res, the result of an outcome that you logically believe to be X, Y, Z is not undermined by your own shadow work. So you can safely say, okay, let's look at, you know, why am I being so German about this? I'm, I'm joking, of course. But on the other hand, acknowledge that Italians are insane when it comes to just public property and society. And it's fair to say, and actually separating the objective judgment from the shadow allows to acknowledge both. This is my personal take. I hope it uh, makes sense within the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, I definitely agree with that. What were you gonna say, Karen? Go for it. Yeah, that NVC would be ideal for this, Heidi, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Natalie, just to observe. When you learn, learn the four steps, you work through them through yourself, and they are superb for just doing it by ourselves, on ourselves, to ourselves, like, and we can do it with ourselves. When this happened i felt this we identify the emotion because i'm telling myself this 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 but then we get down to the we cut through that but what is what am i needing what am i needing i'm needing what fairness is it and we talk it through ourselves and we know when we've gotten there when we feel that sense of ah yes the clarity and the ease the ah now i know what I need to do, I'm going to do that petition, but we've cleared out our own junk, so to speak. And we can, and we, we feel that we, we stop, we, we're not in the tornado anymore, the weather gets calm, and we have clarity. And that's when you know it's worked. And then you are much more effective in the actions you take the appropriate actions you take. So that's my two cents worth. Exactly. Um, Karen, you're, you're saying exactly what I wanted to, to point out too, which is NBC is less about um, 
working with being right or wrong in terms of shadow or experiences and more about um, de-escalating reactivity. Um, more well, about, that's, yeah. That's sort of what is the uh, obsession. It becomes an obsession. That's why I like the concept of shadow boxing. You know, I'm just constantly boxing out and projecting and um, kind of seem to get it, get, get in good place with it where to decide to um, take action and petition, you know, and then within internally within me, feel like I've got some resolve with it to do something about it. Um, and then I kind of let go of it. Would that be a way of trying to identify with a shadow projection or um, just a legitimate anger, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, or social, you know, conscious. Yeah, um, also what I'm hearing there is like there's a difference between healthy anger and unhealthy anger or another way to say that is anger that is standing for something and anger that is standing against something. Right. And we can really feel that in our body. There's a different level of reactivity and of um, yeah. ability to respond in those two. And NBC helps us turn the unhealthy into the healthy. One of the yeah, things I, I love about... I'm sorry. One of the things I love about NVC is the makes it very clear all anger is at its core life affirming. It's like the red warning sign on the dashboard. Something's wrong. Pay attention. Now, what we tell ourselves and where we go with it isn't always healthy or life affirming. But the the fact that there is anger is a sign. Pay attention. Something important is here. Um, and this NVC um, feels really important for late stage second tier entering the transpersonal states because in that transpersonal if reactivity is coming up then we're not really connected with self we're not really connected with other we're no longer in that we space in an authentic way and so um, practicing it while we're understanding systems and we're we're in the early second tier um, can be really really valuable for a later bigger letting go without losing structure and um, direction and the ability to actually be effective in the world. Yeah, that was something I, I was wondering. It's something I think I've seen that comes into integral. Like you were talking about de-escalating and stuff like this. Like it seems to me that integral has more capacity to do with like triggering, um, be it like fight, flight and freeze. Like I actually sometimes think actually like up escalating is sometimes what people need. Like especially if they're stuck in a, in a freeze response or like they're sort of dissociating. Um, just to kind of chip in on the shadow, like to me, some of it's basic in the sense of like, there's something you don't really want to deal with is kind of the thing, like somebody's, they're not fine as they are, or there's a situation that doesn't really want to be dealt with, or you're kind of checking out to the point where um, it doesn't exist. And like, as you say, there's a difference between like, healthy running with anger, like someone annoys me, but they don't, it's not like, the entirety of their existence really just irritates me rather than like there's a way that um i need to respond and karen when you were talking about the fact that uh, one of the guys in the books was actually dealing with gang members like really kind of loud uh, because i thought like if it's strong enough to be able to sit in something uh very triggering like there's one thing of like heidi mentioned this the kind of mother of like soothing the nervous system and calming down and being more kind of soothed. And then there's another skill, which is like, can I handle my stress like skyrocketing and I don't like lose my mind over it? Like, can I be in a high stress situation and still have flexibility and, and mindfulness? And um, I think I actually noticed that as an integral edge. And you, the thing you were talking about transpersonal, like if I get into a meditative state, invariably sooner or later, there's just something like superbly triggering about it. And it's like, it's not a light emotion. It's like, feels like uh, my entire ego is probably going to have to melt. Like I have to really let go. And it's really <laughs> like uh, conjuring some like wild Kundalini sort of animal responses. And that's kind of, um, I, I just think a practice that can contain that just sounds just sounds fantastic. So I'm going to just empathic. Am I am I hearing fear there that you're af afraid of, of of these states overwhelming you? Um, yeah, I think I've had quite a lot of experience of. I was trying to explain to someone on the circling a few times about trauma, and I think one of the 
simplest ways of putting it is like the flood mm-hmm. like being flooded with feelings and experience and not mm-hmm. really being able to work out what the house going on sure now i'll point out that in among the pieces of nvc among the nuances is that sometimes the best thing we can do is remove ourselves from a situation when it is overwhelming and we're not ready to be there without being overwhelmed by our reactions remove ourselves do whatever it takes to get safe and then when we're in a position of safety when we're ready kind of go through it ourselves using the self nvc and work on ourselves but sometimes you need to remove yourself from a situation just then if you need to there are ways to do it but do it yeah yeah, and I think that speaks to some gut instincts, like um, being on the green calls often, like I, I had to wrestle with my shame of not feeling safe, because it's supposed to be everybody's lovely and cuddly and whatever, and everything's welcome, and then slowly realizing that, almost getting to the point of like, uh, almost as a general, unless there's people that I really trust, like if something's particularly painful or trauma, like I just feel like, mm, yeah, I just don't feel like it's, uh, safe to show up. I think that speaks to a different experience of like, because you're sort of trusting your gut instincts. Because safety is not usually uh, communicated intellectually. It's kind of like just the immediate feeling. And in some ways, it's a problem because people get hijacked by being triggered. And then I think that's what I mean about in some ways, like, I'm not sure if you'd call it up escalating, but it's kind of honoring the twin side of that sort of primitive part of the brain. Sometimes it's triggered and it's stuck in a habit and sometimes it's actually uh, empowering and a force for safety or boundaries or something like that. Yeah, Paul, I think that's a really, that's a really good point. And there's something I was thinking about last night was something I've noticed developing in myself is that there's a difference between feeling comfortable and feeling confident. And for example, if I was a boxer heading into the ring to fight someone, I would not feel comfortable at all. I don't feel safe, but I do feel confident in my training and my skills and my abilities. And I've started to notice that as I walk around in life, it, it, sometimes there are a lot of times where I, don't, I really don't feel comfortable, but I still feel confident that I can like deal with situations or deal with certain people or certain scenarios, even though at my core, I, I really feel uncomfortable and, and, and not really safe, but I, I know I'm, I'm capable of doing it. But another thing you said, Paul, that I appreciate was the emphasis on potentially the ego dissolving when com- coming into contact with uh, shadow material and, and that kind of thing. And there's uh, a diagram in, I think it was um, not integral life practice, in uh, the integral vision, the, the small little blue book, where they're, they're depicting shadow work as like, okay, you have the mask of the self or the ego, right? And then you have this shadow. And then after you go through the three, two, one process or whatever, then they're nicely integrated into kind of one entity. And I feel like in some ways that depiction, at least for myself in my experience, is a little deceiving because it presupposes that the ego structure is going to be the same after integrating the shadow, which for me it never has been. It's always been that the shadow is a, is a byproduct of an ego position. And when I truly encounter, integrate the shadow, that ego position dissolves completely. Like, for example, if my shadow is like repressed anger, let's say for an example, right? Why am I angry? Let's say that I have an identity consciously in which anger is incompatible with that identity. I'm a nice guy. I don't get angry. So I just stuff my anger and repress it. I have all the shadow dreams, nightmares projected on other people, et cetera. But for me, the key to integrating the anger is, is not necessarily even about integrating the anger or the identity in the anger. It's about dissolving the idea that I'm a nice guy. Now, of course, I don't think this works for everyone, but this has always been how it's been for me. And once I dissolve the idea of I'm a nice guy, the entire paradigm of nice guy versus angry guy, completely, it's completely irrelevant. It, it, there is no angry guy. There is no nice guy. I'm just, I just exist. Um, and so I, I, I think that if I was to draw the shadow process and depict it, I would emphasize that the ego is not the same after coming through the end of integrating it. It's not like, okay, you have a hole here, you know, a thing and a thing. Now there are two things. It's like the entire paradigm of two separate entities dissolves completely. At least that's been my experience. I feel like that diagram, though I haven't seen it, um, it may be the process could be slowed down a bit that for a time being able to 
um, use the mask to take responsibility for shadow, to be honest that I'm not a nice guy, is one of the steps in between. And later on, then both of the duality can dissolve into a different sort of ego structure. Is that helpful? Does that resonate? I just can I, can think I ask it? Uh, okay. Sorry, can I ask a question to Ryan to see if I understood your point? Uh, what you're saying is that the ego and the shadow are part of the same dualism. And you don't necessarily need to go and hunt for the shadow because if you dissolve the ego, which is bound to a shadow, they sort of both dissolve. So you get the same outcome, whether you're reowning the shadow and, 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 and transcending it or transcending the self. Because ultimately the end point is a resolution of the dualism, not an addition of two parts. Is that what you're saying, Ryan? Uh, yeah, for the, for the most part, I, the only thing I would add to that would be the emphasis uh, in the moment of contacting the shadow. For me, the, 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 the step forward in healing or in, or in growing has been on letting go of the I'm the night. It's not a, like, oh my God, you know, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm so horrified to find this inner anger in me. It's always been, oh, I have to let go of the identity that I'm the, I'm the nice guy. So the emphasis for me personally has not been on integrating. It's been on dissolving. That's been my thing. I would like to, I, I, I would, for myself, I would reframe that as an adjustment and a growth in the ego. The ego is a construct, but it's an absolutely essential construct. Otherwise, we would have no, no self-sense at the level of personality at all. It's like enlarging and maturing the ego to be in a positive relationship with this material. Um, so that's how I, I would reframe that to myself. But I see it, and, and um, Damiano, I see it as more than a duality because I've done, a, I've read a lot of Jung. Uh, it's, there's the, the persona, our public personality, who we are to ourselves, our shadow, stuff that we're not aware of. And then there, there are two deeper steps to that. So to Jung, the, the whole self structure was a quaternity rather than a duality. And I just want to throw yet another thing in there is that the whole subject of ego death is a very big subject and that would deserve a whole session on its own. So over and out. Yeah. But, but I would agree. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Mike. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to come in there too, because it, what I heard from you, Ryan, is that you think we can integrate the shadow and then everything is fine. And I don't think so, because I think shadow is a constant uh, thing. Also, the shadow is sort of developing with us. So we might have integrated the uh, shadow from early childhood or something. Or Damiano, I'm very grateful that you pointed out to me that it is uh, what I was uh, handling today was probably my collective shadow of being German, you know? Yeah, at least partly, you know? This is also, we have a cultural shadow, collective shadow, we have the ind individual shadow. So. I don't think that it is so easy to just sort of get rid of it by integrating it. Yeah, integrating, being aware of it, but I don't think we neither can get rid of the shadow elements, we might transform them a little bit, nor of the ego, because I think it's, it's part of, of, of what we are, I mean. And what you say of shadow, I like it from Asagioli also, no? I don't know, Damiano, if you know this famous, <clears throat> Italian psycho, uh, psychologist, um, um, psychosynthesis, and he has also four different uh, uh, sh sh um, consciousness um, places, you know, uh, the, the, the golden shadow and the, 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 the black shadow, let's say, or he doesn't call it shadow, uh, unconscious, it's the unconscious, and, and then also the unconscious, the immediate unconscious, which we, which we know that we don't know, but there is also the unconscious, which we don't know what we, what we don't know. And I think what we are talking about shadow is the, the part we can know, which we just don't see at the moment. And there are others further down, which probably we don't. <laughs> maybe we stumble upon them, but uh, maybe not. But I, I would like to talk about the, shed, um, the, the ego development thing about uh, Terry O'Fallon or about uh, uh, Susan Kokreuter, the models. I don't know if you are aware of that. They're very fascinating. Um, and we did a show in the Wisdom Factory with Mark Foreman that was also about the, uh, the, the levels. Uh, 
and how you can realize on what level you are in your ego development. And uh, coming back to Ryan, I don't think that when you have the spiritual, let's say the ego falls away, that then everything goes. That's exactly what Ken says. It's not the case because uh, um, all these spiritual enlightened people have had that, but they still were in their ego development, who knows where, you know, so the shadow part was still present. So I do think we need both works, the growing up and the waking up work. So. Yeah, I, I think I uh, miscommunicated because I agree with everything you said, Heidi. I, it was all, it's all semantic miscommunication because uh, I don't, I don't, the word ego too is kind of a difficult word. I don't really mean ego in, in I mean, there's a million different contexts from which that word makes sense. But for me, I'm using it specifically in terms of what generated the shadow in the first place. And, and all I'm saying, and I do agree completely that it's an ongoing process. It's not a one and done, the big one, everything is perfect, right? It's, a, it's an ongoing process. But for me, personally, the emphasis of the growth is not integration of the shadow. For me, the emphasis in that moment of meditation is the letting go of the identity that produced it in the first place. And whenever I let go of that, and of course, it always, you know, the identity, I let go of it, it comes back in a different way. Like you're saying, Karen, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, there's a simultaneous synthesis or integration or development of the ego self as well. But in these moments of meditation, I phenomenologically experience a dissolution of, into emptiness uh, temporarily when I let go of what produced the shadow in the first place. And whether we call that ego or not, ego may not be a good word for that. I don't know what word that would be, but it would be like any kind of like one of the million of you know, identities or positions that we have towards anything in life. To me, the emphasis is not, has not been on integrating into something solid. It's been about disintegrating what produced that in the first place. And then later on, it'll come back and then you do it again. But every time it happens, I'm always, I'm simultaneously dissolving and integrating into something solid simultaneously. Yeah, it makes me, I was just thinking, Brian, when you were talking, like it made me think of the spiritual metaphor of like the caterpillar to the butterfly. And this is what I took from what you were saying in the first place was, I guess, I'm not sure if I'm misinterpreting you, but like the, it, it can be all consuming in some ways, like part of you may have to die or it's going to be a mess. It's not like you have this, you have the shadow piece and you have the ego piece, they kind of come together and you and you you know you, you would come to a higher level like it can be like that and i think like the more surface level tends to go like that but the really deep stuff in my experience like deep trauma or deep childhood stuff or i'd be curious on other people's um opinions with the transpersonal like karen you were talking about uh, ego death being a big subject but i think that possibly comes out integral as well where there's something uh, you can at times go into something that feels so all-encompassing that it's it's almost like mandatory that you have some kind of spiritual space in which to contain it because you are going to lose your ego. Like there's nothing to uh, grasp on. And I know personally I struggle with that a lot because those are usually the most stressful times. And also it's kind of harder to talk to people about that because I think it's um, maybe it's higher capability or maybe it's more rare or something. I don't know. But um I think it's one of the hardest things and also one of the most beautiful things because you're probably bringing on the biggest transformation. Um, attempting to weave what a number of you have been pointing at, um, the, the way that I experience it is um, the, the dissolution of the ego and of trauma is the dissolution of an automatic choice and regaining the power to see now and make a conscious choice. So rather than assuming that I've been a nice person or I'm a mean person, I'm dissolving that, that con constant story and able to respond appropriately consciously now. And that can be one of the scary things about transitioning into like a real transpersonal state is um, if we haven't built the scaffolding to um, be able to make conscious choices in a really like informed way where we're seeing reality. If we don't trust that we can see reality, if we haven't done our shadow work, then the all of the emotions, the trauma can come up at one time and we don't know how to navigate it and get overwhelmed. But if we have support with that choice making, even if it's just with a therapist or a good friend that's compassionate, um, stuff can dissolve really quickly. This is bringing up for me the idea, which is 
actually new to me how important it is to have all those rungs at first tier in some sort of balance to have that structure before we move solidly into second tier and especially third tier as you said natalie because things our self-sense does start to dissolve at those higher levels of second tier moving into third tier and unless what i'm hearing now is unless we have done the work or even if it's remedial work to get our six first tier levels solid, I mean, in some kind of healthy structure in ourselves, as we start to move into the second to third tier and the old self senses start to dissolve, we can dissolve downward instead of upward and regress hard into the lower first tier. And so I'm thinking, so I'm seeing, suddenly seeing a need for a lot of remedial work on the first tier, get all of those six chakras really, at least to some degree, healthy and in balance before we push off through the seventh into the second chakra. This is this is a big, kind of a big idea for me. Wow, thank you all. Yeah. And thank you, Karen, also, because that makes me aware of that I really often I am in the situation that I fear the regression instead of, you know, oh yeah, thank you. Paul, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Um, and you actually made me think of like, I was thinking today about my kind of check-in and Heidi, when you were talking about like the integral often, uh, it's more comfortable like bashing ideas against each other than it is about being empathetic and this kind of stuff. And I noticed like when I first got on these calls, there was part of me that was ashamed for my uh, lack of development as it were. And like kind of each week kind of coming and being like, oh yeah, that's kind of normal. And um, Karen, when you're talking about like having the lower ladders, be in order like i think one of the things i really struggle with is having at times these very high integral experiences especially of like subtle body and you know i have bdd so i struggle with my body which is i, I started thinking about it and it's, in many ways that's like the bottom rung that's beige essentially and it's kind of um sometimes if i embrace my integral more it's like the lower rungs will uh will come out more and it's kind of humbling to be like, like this, this week I had a real experience of red and like the tribal below. And there's part of me that's just shame for that. being like, oh, am I even integral? You know, am I really, I've got all this progression and stuff. Whereas actually like that is part of the integral process and it's really necessary. And to have a bit of a tangent, because there was a conversation about Jordan Peterson and I was thinking about it today in response of like, you know, is Peterson integral, is it not? Whatever, but uh, that's important. But it made me think of like, you can have more power at times if you have a stronger lower level than you do the higher ones. Like at times, if you have a really good red or a really good orange, you can be more force for the world than you can have like being higher tier. So those, those lower levels are always like um, going to need to be empowered. And it kind of seems like integral people should value each lower level more than anybody else because they should be able to see how valuable they are, which takes a certain humility of being like smacked way back down on the ladder and being like, oh, you know, I'm not as developed as I thought, but actually that's juicy that's territory. Where, that's where the power is. But the, there is an amazing video from Ken Wilber recently. I don't remember exactly the name, was it about shadow work? It's, it's one of the later videos he made. And he, he mentions this concept that I think it's, he kind of throw it out really lightly, but I think it's an, incredibly important, which speaks to what we're saying, which is the idea that the, the awakening process is almost like an energetic process. That, that sounds also plausible. And what he was saying is that every time you add a new step, the amount of energy that you need to ultimately go to the other step is larger. So the more you alienate, the less energy you have to actually break free. And it, it really, like, the, the reason I love this metaphor is because it, it's, it speaks to a, in thermodynamics, like it's the idea that there's a, a minimum amount of energy necessary to do a quantum leap. And that energy is the information process of the different levels. And when you alienate that, you just don't have that energy. It's working against you. And I, 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 I had, if I can share just an experience that I think speaks to what you were saying about the subtle states, we were discussing it yesterday when I was doing meditation in the past weeks and I either work to reintegrate sort of the, the, for example, fear inside the body or to reintegrate 
while breeding sentiments of aggression and anger and resentment, those two times that during the night I heavily focused on that, I experienced going into the dream state and conscious dreaming. Really vivid three hour conscious dreaming. And I, and I just like could see how it was like physiologically correlated that process of, of reowning with giving energy to the subtle state to do more stuff. And it, to me, it's intriguing because it, it feels like something you can map, you can sort of check out, you can measure. And, and we all have an intuitive sense of how far we are from breaking free of ourselves. And I think that that intuitive sense is that sense of alienation, disidentification, or identification that, that makes for a really simple, clear map. So just my way of saying I completely agree. <clears throat> we're, we're, I just want to say really quickly, we're coming up on time uh, already. Um, so if people wanted to just start uh, wrapping up or, or offering a closing, since there's a lot of people today, but, just, but this, I'll just uh, end with this. And I really appreciate today's conversation and how it started with NBC and it kind of turned into shadow work. And I know the two things are often dovetailed, but something I thought would be cool to do maybe for like uh, subsequent calls we did a very thorough investigation into red last time and integrating red and exploring red. I thought we should do that with all the stages going from purple all the way to green and just have an adventure. And then we can recommend books or exercises or how to get in touch with that. What kind of group you want to go to, to get in touch with that, you know? And uh, cause we has, what you mentioned, Karen Voorhees about um, all the, the importance of those first tier runs and having those in order. Uh, before adventuring to higher places and and as Paul what you're mentioning and uh, you know being able to resource the power of a very integrated first tier stage uh, and so I thought it would be fun to explore every stage uh, up the spiral thank you yeah awesome awesome Ryan yeah. and I just wanted to add that I'd like to us all to acknowledge the consciousness that we are bringing to this that yes even when we have to suddenly get smacked down and deal with beige or purple or red or whatever that we are doing it knowing that we're doing it rather than being lost in it that's already very much second tier I wanted to other Karen, I saw that you are unmuted yourself, so I, you, you were quite silent today, and also Rona, so you should have some more space. <laughs> well, I, uh, I realized that um, for, um, I was in a women's group for about four years, and I realized that what we were doing was very similar to NBC. It was always you come in and you start with what's distracting you, and so that you could lay that out on the table and then be in the room with the other women. And there were some men sometime. Um, but we would go through a process where we would state that and then we would state how we feel about it and talk about the, um, um, you know, the, the, the facts that are, that are the facts, how I feel about it, and then process it that way. And then, find a way to get to curiosity. And always the last step was to go to curiosity. And, and in doing so, it, as I was saying earlier about the other process I did, it creates more room. Um, I think there's a, a name of this kind of therapy uh, and I will try to find it. I'm, I'm, I will uh, call that therapist, but I cannot recommend it enough because it, it really, and, and some of the guys really struggled in there and I don't mean to be sexist, but because you, you, you have to name your feelings. And um, a good friend of mine was in this process and he needed the sheet, Karen, you might want to post that sheet, that feelings inventory, <clears throat> he really needed it. Whereas other people might be much more um, in touch with their feelings. But it was, a, it was an amazing kind of shadow work to do because it wasn't so much about getting stuck in your story. It was, here's the story that I'm making up, here's how I feel about it. And then you feel it. You know, I feel pissed and, and the group allowed you, okay, you just felt that anger. You felt that sadness or you felt joy and you felt it. And, and when, by feeling that feeling, it, it, um, that which you resist persists, right? And by feeling that feeling, it doesn't get so, it doesn't uh, stay so big. And then learning to do that day to day, um, I, I, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of explaining it, but I'll, I'll see if I can come up with an example of this because it's probably the best shadow work I've ever done. And, um, and, and I also would like to go through the different levels because I'm very familiar with when I go into red 
and that fierceness that I could do, but I'm not as familiar with the, the beige and the purple and um, those two. I am also familiar with the amber on up, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a great group and I look forward to seeing you guys again. Over now. Um, I think I really enjoyed, I guess, uh, what I kind of see is like actually having green, it seems like, like not just green, because I know that was my, so my thing with NBC, but like having the quality of empathy, human relationships, like being with triggers and shadow and therapy and all this kind of stuff. Like I know plus I really want, I really want that with integral because it's so enlivening the whole relationship side of it. And then also the, the fact that it was kind of somewhat tied to shadow and uh, spiral, like having people talk from red and blue and green and all this kind of stuff. It sort of feels like everybody gives their voice to each stage. So it kind of, for me, if somebody expresses themselves, I can feel my own green or whatever it happens to be uh, being filled out. And I don't know, I can feel my emotions and like my, like I feel more, I, I guess I feel more of my feelings after this call than maybe prior, like feeling more safe, feeling like I can be touchy feely and wounded and all this kind of stuff. So, um, I guess I kind of, I don't know, I guess I kind of am, I'm being more green because it just feels like nice. <laughs> it just feel like, yeah, so. I think what hit me uh, in trying to pull it all together, uh, um, the experience uh, today, I think is the, um, the value of the um, meditation uh, stage uh, developments that kind of disciplined my brain to be um, able to um, feel the altered states with wherever I'm at or not at. I was thinking with the example of the um, nice guy um, that, <clears throat> you know, there's a certain uh, feeling about that, but then when I'm angry, there's a certain feeling about it. But that for me, the um, ego, more like the mediator, uh, the integration for me was the balancing, the, the collaborating work together that I can be a very nice guy that can get very pissed off. <laughs> and, so, and so that's what I meant about, um, mean about, um, that I seem to grasp things better when I can relate my energy uh, experience uh, with wherever I'm, I'm at. And um, so I think, um, and then that what got behind that was for me about um, that, let's say I'm a nice guy or I'm an angry guy, but I'm also not that. I'm also not a, a nice guy. I'm also not an angry guy, uh, the, the, the going deeper you know, into a uh, more higher self that lets go of the ego and the relative identities that I used to become so attached to. And the liberation that is for me to just just be, you know, and um, so it seems like all the sharing and everything today really took me to a higher consciousness level. <laughs> and again, I, I thank you guys. I think it's a, a, just a great group. And I just love, uh, sharing. Uh, I also wanted to um, thanks Natalie and Karen for, for doing that exercise. I think it's just yes. like really nice to see like practical real world things that we can try and test and so uh, I, I think I think it's interesting if we if we could find more of, of these things to share within the conversation. Uh, I, I think it's fantastic, and the the whole idea. Uh, I think there seems to be like just the whole idea that shaking the identification, whether it's with conversational structures or shadow work, is like it's all that same process of just bouncing around the self until it can let go. And I really think there is merit to the idea that you do these kind of conversations that you showed together with people and it is fairly logical and plausible to say that you're planting a seed for a general dis positive destabilization that may actually ultimately set that person not 
it's not that you set that person the course to enlightenment, but you've added a little bit. You, you've, or, you, or you've taken a little bit uh, of the pressure of attachment to things away just by conversation. I think that's fantastically powerful. And uh, I would love to learn more about it as, as we go ahead. Okay, so I do my check out. I'm very, very pleased how this group, this group is going because it's really nourishing and I, I love it. And I also would love if we would build three, three uh, tri triads to do the, the work, not just talk about it, but really uh, do it. And whoever is interested, uh, let's get together and, and do that maybe once a week or something for a while until we feel... Um, confident to, to be more able to do that. Because theoretically, uh, the nonviolent communication, I know it for 10 years or something, you know, but really the practical thing, I never did it up to this point. So, and you said it takes two years. It's a long time, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to do it. So, and Damiano, thanks for your, as I said before, your reminder. And I would love to talk to you too, also about Italy, but also about other Anytime. things. Anytime. I'm all up for bashing both Germans and Italians. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and everybody, I would invite you into my shows uh, with Karen. It's, it will be streaming soon and in two weeks or so. And with Ryan, I will do one. And I, I, I just love to talk with people who have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> and Natalie, it's so nice to have you here. And uh, I would also invite the women to the women's group I do once a, once a month. If you are interested, let, let me know. And we talked last time three times about resilience. And next time I thought we do a, um, a sort of a comparison between uh, emotional intelligence and resilience. So how, how do they do they? come together or not and things like that. So if you're interested, let me know. It will be the, always the third Tuesday uh, in a month. Uh, in about this time, more or less, half an hour later than the time it is now. Also in March, it's different than America is somewhere else than we are. So we have to figure out what time we will meet. <laughs> anyway. Yes. We have daylight savings times next week, so. Yeah, and we have it three, three weeks later. So this will be three weeks of chaos because nobody knows which way it goes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And Natalie, thanks, and Karen, thanks for that uh, presentation. It was very, very instructive. Right. Thank you. Who else needs to check out then? Uh, Ryan, you have the last word, I guess. <laughs> Oh, Natalie, did you get a chance to check out and say something? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I love the idea of going through each of the stages and actually have um, a practice group around NVC and some of the shadow work in relationship to each of the stages so we can talk about some of the, the edges that we have there. Um, and at the same time, I need to see what my schedule can handle. <laughs> That's another reality, but... Um, this group has also been very valuable. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for sharing your experience. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I really look forward to uh, seeing everyone next Sunday. And, uh, and thanks again, Heidi, for the whole Zoom setup. And, and thanks again, Karen and Natalie, for uh, doing the presentation. I like that format. So God bless you all. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Take care, folks. Aloha.